Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The 2016 Perry Award Ceremony in honor of Ambassador Inaudi will begin in a few minutes. We'd ask you to please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'd ask you to please take your seats. As it is January, I would like to wish you all a very happy new year and to welcome you to the kickoff of the Perry Center 20th anniversary events this year. As we begin, my name is Jeff Murphy and I'm the Chief of Staff of the Perry Center. I have an administrator request. I'd ask if you please have a cell phone that you'd please turn that to vibrate uh, so as not to disrupt the ceremony. At this time, uh, in accordance with military tradition, I'd ask you to please stand as the official party enters. Please be seated. I would now like to invite Mr. Mark Wilkins, director of the Perry Center, to come to the podium to offer some remarks. Well, good afternoon to all. Uh, Under Secretary of State, Tom Shannon, uh, the Secretary General of the Organization of American States, Ambassador Luis Almagro, Ambassadors, and there are many of you here today, thank you, and other distinguished members of the Diplomatic Corps, distinguished guests, family members, and friends of Ambassador Naudi, ladies and gentlemen, friends of the Perry Center, all. Uh, good afternoon, welcome to the National Defense University and the William J. Perry Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies. Uh, today's event is to honor Ambassador Naudi, and it is our first event of 2017. Uh, 2017 marks an important milestone in the, center, in the center's uh, history uh, and is the first event of our uh, 20th anniversary. And uh, our first director, Jay Cope, will be coming up in a few minutes and talking uh, more to that. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, I have to admit being uh, a little awestruck and impressed by the ever-growing RSVP list for this event. Uh, uh, including many ambassadors, several who I've had the, uh, the honor to work for before. Uh, but as I studied that list, I couldn't help but reflect that the, uh, the collective experience in here, uh, particularly on the behalf of the U.S. government, uh, reflects uh, a half a century of both the envisioning and the implementation of our U.S. regional policy for the Western Hemisphere. And uh, the execution of that, uh, you know, falls on the shoulders of uh, all of you in the uh, um, auditorium this afternoon, and especially uh, Ambassador Naudi. Uh, I think looking back, it's a track record uh, we could all be proud of. Um, and despite us working in a world, you know, where, where conflict and ominous future trends are the order of the day, uh, the Americas, our, our collective home, remains a, a, a region of the world uh, re regionally uh, at peace and, and prosperous as well. 
And, and although some of these future ominous challenges are not going to pass this hemisphere by, I think that we can all agree that if we keep the, the faith, uh, nourish our democratic institutions, and truly invest in the long-term security uh, and opportunity for all of our citizens, there are as many opportunities uh, as there are challenges for this hemisphere. So on to today's ceremony. Um, every year, this community of security and defense professionals gathers to recognize those of us among ourselves whose contributions to defense and security education uh, made its sectional contributions. Uh, this honor named for our center's founder, the 19th uh, Secretary of Defense, William Perry. During his tenure, Dr. Perry ushered in a, uh, a doctrine of prevention rather than deterrence. He emphasized that the best defense uh, was always achieved by acting proactively, addressing threats and challenges before they happen. And by doing that and founding this institution, he carved out the academic space of which we operate within. So today, the Perry Center strives to build bridges to the Americas via programs promoting effective and accountable security and defense security governance. So at this time, I would like to invite forward our founding director, Mr. Jay Cope. Although uh, the bad news is, is that uh, some of you attended his retirement ceremony a few months back. The good news is that he's uh, agreed to attend or uh, continue his affiliation with NDU and the Perry Center as a visiting senior fellow. We're delighted we can still count on his experience and wisdom. Mr. Jacob. Hi, good afternoon. Mr. Director, Mr. Secretary, Mr. Secretary General, current retired ambassadors and flag officers, Carol and Audi, members of the Anaudi family, personal friends of the ambassador, and fellow colleagues of the Americas. I'm very proud to say that the Perry Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies will celebrate its 20th anniversary in 2017. Sort of makes me feel old, in a sense. They have had 5,451 alumni mostly from the Americas, but also from other regions of the world, to include China, Russia, uh, many African countries, Middle Eastern countries. The hope this year is that Cuba finally will accept an invitation to complete the list of neighboring officials who have attended an international course here at NDU. Hopefully that will happen. Mark, I appreciate your invitation to reflect on the origins of the center and to explain why I nominated Ambassador Anaudi for the Perry Award in the individual category. The roots of the center go back to 1993 and an initiative with the then Defense Security Assistance Agency to create an executive seminar at NDU to discuss civil-military cooperation in a country's national security. Before this idea could be developed fully, it was superseded by the planning for a major milestone in U.S. defense relations with Latin America and the Caribbean, the July 1995 Conference of Defense Ministers of the Americas held in Colonial Williamsburg, Virginia. Now, these conferences continue. In fact, the Ministry of National Security of Trinidad and Tobago recently hosted the 12th conference in October, a very successful conference. But back in 1995, with a border conflict simmering between Ecuador and Peru, Secretary Perry found that he did not know personally any of his counterparts in the hemisphere unlike his relations in Europe. The conference provided an unprecedented chance to initiate high-level dialogue on regional defense and security issues. Three themes which highlighted foremost concern for the ambassadors were discussed. 
confidence and security building measures, defense cooperation, and the armed forces in 21st century democracies. Confidence and security building measures stressed defense transparency, peaceful settlement of disputes, and destabilizing arms acquisitions. Those of you who were working policy back in the 90s can relate to many of those. They were some heated issues. The defense cooperation focused on joining UN peacekeeping, support to humanitarian relief and demining, uh, as well as collaborative counter-drug efforts in support of law enforcement. Armed forces in the 21st century focused on exchanging information on human rights training and the importance of encouraging interaction between civilian and military personnel to develop better understanding of each other's contributions to national security and to a democratic society. The last theme was particularly challenging because few people in and out of government in Latin America and the Caribbean had even minimal expertise or general knowledge of defense issues. Ministerial discussions produced agreement on the problem, but no concrete answers. A month later, August of 1995, Secretary Perry, on a trip to Germany, visited the relatively new Marshall Center in uh, southern Germany that focused on professional education for military officers from former Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact countries. He saw the potential of a center-type approach to education in the Americas. In January 1996, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Western Hemisphere Affairs asked NDU's Institute for National Strategic Studies and the University of Miami's North-South Center to propose their concept for a center to educate civilians. Secretary Perry chose NDU's approach, and at the second ministerial, the Argentine ministerial in October 1996, he pledged to create a center in Washington focused on educating civilians with defense-related duties and to create a cadre of knowledgeable civilians for the future. Over the 20 years, approximately 70% of the center's students have been civilians. Roughly 20% have been women. The Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies would develop executive-level academic programs tailored for the requirements of Latin American and Caribbean states that stimulate civilian and military thinking for defense policy and civil military relations and provide a common understanding of defense decision making and resource management in a democratic society without being doctrinaire in the approach. In presenting its courses, the center overcame traditional regional suspicions of U.S. motives and intentions. It also uh, was able to minimize military sensitivity about educating civilians and encouraging oversight. From the beginning, there, was, there has been transparency, frequent consultations, and the incorporation of suggestions, including the name of the center, which was an Argentine proposal. The original vision has fostered linkages across the hemisphere among civilian, military, and defense counterparts and provided a neutral civil-military forum. Important steps have been taken to further the center's motto, in Latin, mens et fides mutua, meaning mutual understanding and trust. Ambassador Anaudi not only provided the Latin translation of the motto, <laughs> making sure that I got it right, 
but also was a sounding board for ideas and an active supporter of the development of the NDU proposal. But his contributions go much deeper. His wide-ranging personal role in the shaping and pursuing of U.S. and international public policy, his ability to engage civilian and military leaders, his numerous speaking appearances, the legacy of his writings, and his willingness to spend time working with students and junior foreign service and military officers was an inspiration and provided the intellectual underpinning for the NDU concept, that is today, the Perry Center. His important contributions have bolstered conflict resolution, advanced democracy and the rule of law, advocated for a positive cooperative security environment, clarified and strengthened the distinct responsibilities of military and police forces in support of democratic security, and showed what can be accomplished by strengthening mutual understanding and trust. Ambassador Anaudi's many accomplishments are consistent, are consistent with and support the Perry Center's mission, which is why I recommended him to receive the 2016 William J. Perry Award for Excellence in Security and Defense Education. Now, I will now pass the lectern to Tom Shannon, and it is a distinct pleasure to introduce the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. Many in the audience know him personally, and you still have the main points of his distinguished career in the, in the program. But it is not mentioned in the program that Tom, as a junior foreign service officer, once worked around on many assignments Ambassador Anaudi. He didn't work directly for him, but he was definitely working around him and had a lot of contact with him. As many of us know, yes. And they have stayed in, in contact as Tom assumed duties of increasing responsibility within the Western Hemisphere Affairs community and more recently the Department of State. Tom, it's a real pleasure that you could join us today. Thank you. Listen, good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be here, a real honor to be here. And thank you, Jay, for your very kind introduction, and uh, thank you, Mark, for your great work as director of the Perry Center. Um, I want to thank all present today. I mean, when I look out into the crowd, as noted, I, I know many of you, and what I see really is a who's who of diplomats, soldiers, and national security professionals who have worked across careers in my favorite part of the world, the Western Hemisphere, the Americas. Today is a recognition and a manifestation of the deep respect and admiration in which we all hold today's honoree, Luigi Ainaudi. Jules Cambon, a great French diplomat of the early 20th century and France's ambassador in Washington from 1897 to 1902, once wrote that diplomats, unlike soldiers, are not, as a rule, the spoilt children of historians. What he meant, of course, is that it's uh, more interesting to write of military uh, victories and conflicts than it is to write of negotiations and diplomatic events. In fact, Cambon lamented in regard to his own country that many great diplomats exercised such discretion and secrecy in their work that their great achievements have earned them what he called the silence of posterity. We are lucky that the work of Luigi Ainaudi, while always conducted with discretion and often secretly, has earned public acknowledgement and applause. He has received awards from Presidents Carter, Reagan, and Bush, from Secretaries Kissinger and Albright, 
He was recognized by the presidents of Ecuador and Peru for his historic work in brokering peace between these two countries and has been decorated by the government of Italy and the King of Spain. In other words, he has plenty of bling. <laughs> but today's award ceremony is different and in some ways overdue because today the Perry Center recognizes Luigi Naudi as an educator and as someone who has displayed excellence in security and defense education. It is fitting that it is the Perry Center that is offering this award. As Jay noted, for 20 years, the Perry Center has stood at the intersection of defense policy and education and served as the premier venue for policymakers, practitioners, and academics from throughout the Americas. It is the center that began with the purpose of promoting security governance and military civilian relations in our hemisphere, and over time has shown an ability to adapt to our changing hemisphere and anticipate the future threats that face our Americas, with special focus on the multidimensional nature of these threats. This combination of security, governance, and the social elements of our development is quite remarkable. As I prepared my remarks for today and consulted many of my colleagues who had worked closely with Luigi, I heard one refrain over and over again. Luigi is an educator. Those who worked with him on the Ecuador-Peru talks remember him assigning readings designed to enhance their knowledge of the historical context of the negotiations. And he would quiz his minions on the, readers, on the readings. His Socratic method of instruction was soon dubbed a Luigi hazing by his colleagues. <laughs> to those of us, such as myself, who worked with him but at some remove, and in my case, I worked with him both at the State Department and at the OAS, uh, his instruction was done through mentorship and involving us in his diplomatic practice. Luigi had five rules of diplomacy. Rule one, listen. Rule two, listen. Rule three, listen. Well, you get it. Um, <clears throat> the first and the fifth rule were the same, listen. Attentiveness in his mind was the basis for successful diplomacy. This was followed by a second axiom. When brokering a dispute between two parties, let the parties take the lead. He understood what great powers often do not understand that patience, respect, and accommodation are the basis of sustainable and enduring agreements. In other words, efforts to impose solutions rarely work. But Luigi's technique was combined with vision and inspiration. He understood intuitively the culture, politics, and ambitions of our hemisphere. He understood the creative dynamic that defined diplomacy in our hemisphere and how our support for democracy, human rights, and social justice would unlock profound forces that would change the shape of hemispheric engagement and cooperation. He understood that the positive engagement of the United States, especially in the institutions of the inter-American system, would help guide our hemisphere towards peace and prosperity. Not since Cordell Hull has an American diplomat so consistently and successfully defined the importance of our hemisphere for the long-term security and well-being of our great republic and the American people. Cardinal Richelieu once said, a capable prince represents a great treasure in a state. A skillful counsel, as it should be, is no less a treasure. But the acting of both in concert is, an inval is invaluable because from it de derives the true happiness of the state. Luigi Anaudi is that skillful counsel. He is that national treasure. And for this, Luigi, we are grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Shannon. And I would like to invite Mark Wilkins and Ambassador Hinaudi to step forward for the presentation of the 2016 Barry Award.
Mr. Director, Mr. Secretary, Mr. Cope, Mr. Secretary General, ambassadors and flag officers, my wife, Carol, members of my family, and personal friends, amigos todos. I thank those who found me deserving of this award. Public service, like the priesthood, is a calling. Jay Cope and Tom Shannon each exemplify the highest standards of that calling. Jay in the Army and as a civilian, Tom in the Career Foreign Service. I am indebted to both of you more than I can say. And our countries and all of us here and beyond are better off for your service. I met Bill Perry when he was Secretary of Defense. And I have just finished what he calls his selective memoir. Um, my journey at the nuclear brink. With a foreword by my old boss, George Schultz, Perry writes how honored he was to have this center named for him. And he makes a passionate plea to eliminate nuclear weapons before they eliminate us. It's a good read, and I recommend it. I am proud, and uh, the word really is touched, that so many of you are here. Uh, even though many of us have worked closely together, you come from different times and from circles that do not often intersect. Your combined presence today makes this an unusual ceremony and for me a very much prized reunion. Thank you. In accepting this award, I would like to share some thoughts about where we are now and what may lie ahead. The last 20 years have been hard on the international order. So much so that disorder seems increasingly a better description. The current issue of foreign affairs calls the situation simply out of order. Governing has become harder and more complicated. Citizen demands for a better life have grown, but disparities in power and cultural differences have not been erased. In some cases, they've been sharpened. World War II ended with winners and losers. The Cold War had blocks and anti-blocks. And now what has been called the end of ideology has left us with fewer shared viewpoints than ever. And these are conditions that hamper international understanding and disrupt long-held concepts. Take, for example, the Organization of American States, which I have had the honor and pleasure of serving both as a representative of my country and as an officer of the entire region. It is the world's oldest international regional organization. The OAS is a multilateral organization of the sovereign states of the Western Hemisphere. This simple definition has three concepts. Multilateralism, 
is based on generalized principles of conduct, the creation of predictable universal rules rather than a temporary coalition of a few countries on a specific problem. Sovereignty, the sovereign equality of states, is the organizing principle of the international system and has been that since the 1648 Peace of Westphalia. Geography, as in the proposition, the peoples of this hemisphere stand in a special relationship to one another which sets them apart from the rest of the world. Today, all three of these concepts are operationally challenged. Multilateralism is associated with inefficiency more than order. International law has been weakened by repeated failures to ratify treaties or abide by their obligations. A cynic might argue that multilateralism is now just an idealistic illusion in an increasingly Hobbesian world. Sovereignty has long meant that individual states are inviolate from outside intervention and free to decide whether or not to participate in any particular activity. The problem is that our times require cooperation. Cyberspace, illegal drugs, weapons from small arms to nukes and now drones, migration, terrorism, disease, climate, and most economic activity cannot be dealt with by any one state, any one country acting alone. Does this mean that sovereignty is obsolete? Finally, in the age of the jet and the internet, does geography still matter? 20 years ago, a senior official of the administration of the United States told me flatly that geography was no longer relevant to foreign policy. Here at the Perry Center and the National Defense University, we know better. War is intimately related to sovereignty, geography, and even multilateralism. The League of Nations was created to end war, but had no military authority. The United Nations Charter authorized the use of force in Chapter 7. The OAS Charter purposely conveyed no coercive authority. These formulas are all incomplete. Neither force nor diplomacy can work alone. What is needed is to integrate the various elements of power. You can't say, we'll deal with this militarily or just economically or just diplomatically. You can't say, we'll deal with this multilaterally and that bilaterally, and this one will take care of unilaterally. Major problems require the application in some form of all elements of power, civil and military, hard and soft, multilateral, bilateral, and unilateral. Trying to integrate power by making the interagency system work is how I survived in Washington. My mentors at the State Department all served on the National Security Council. One of them conditioned becoming Assistant Secretary of State on also chairing the NSC Interdepartmental Group. 
And when that was accepted, he promptly appointed me its executive secretary. Years later, having done that apprenticeship, when I was asked to represent the United States in the effort to end the fighting between Peru and Ecuador, I followed his example and asked to team immediately with Southern Command. In a dispute that went back to colonial times, 5,000 special forces, soldiers, good ones, from the two countries had become entangled in mountainous jungle terrain, known as the Cinepa. To prevent escal escalation, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, and the United States, all guarantors of an earlier treaty, contributed soldiers to a military observation mission, known as MOMEP, to separate forces and give diplomacy a chance. My guarantor counterparts and I would share intelligence, listen to each other's views, and meet until we hammered out a course our governments could all support. We approached things differently, but the give and take and the respect was mutual. And often our meetings led to a course different from anyone that any of us had individually started with. Whenever that happened, interagency coordination was key to keeping Washington in sync as well. Sometimes, frankly, I felt as though I was dealing with two wars, one abroad and the other here at home. The peace agreements ultimately settled the land boundaries at the origins of the conflict, but extended also to river navigation, trade, parks, burial of military casualties, human rights, and economic development. It took almost four years, but we succeeded where few believed we could. And the peace between Ecuador and Peru resolved the last active territorial conflict on the South American mainland and removed the arms race contagion from the region. Conventional war among states in the Americas today is almost unthinkable. Now in this lower threat environment, collective security obligations have given way to a concept championed initially by the countries of the Commonwealth Caribbean, that security should be understood as multidimensional. And this approach expanded security concerns from traditional defense matters to trafficking in persons, drug abuse, and the special security concerns of small island states. Yet even with this more consensual approach, security and defense matters remain problematic. Uncertainty about military and police roles creates confusion. Asymmetries in power breed illusions and distrust. Tensions among neighbors still flare up. The end of the Cold War reduced, but did not eliminate, concerns about the activities of countries from outside the hemisphere. And the variety and complexity of these security issues makes clear that no one policy fits all. Every country has tended to set its own course. Nothing is automatic. So what should we do in the midst of this growing uncertainty? First, multilateral consultations should be part of any strategy. Multilateralism was the core of the international order the United States led in creating after World War II. The United States today is more focused inward and faces competition from many quarters. The multilateral order has eroded and U.S. participation has reduced. 
Yet even when agreement is elusive, broad consultation can reduce confusion and set the stage for future cooperation. The excellent article, and it is an excellent article, lead article in Foreign Affairs that I cited earlier, calls for a system of, quote, sovereign obligation, unquote, to deal with the world's growing common problems. I was amused at the same time that the author suggests the United States consult only half a dozen other, quote, other major powers, unquote. I mean, it's nice to know that uh, the powerful have obligations as well as rights. But in my experience, democracy is just as important between countries, among countries, as it is within them. If smaller countries do not receive respect, they're unlikely to be part of the solution. Our founding fathers set a good example in our Declaration of Independence. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that all be heard. And idealism quite aside, success is harder if you don't consult. Second, Respect the law and support local institutions. In the Peru-Ecuador conflict, the Rio Protocol authorized the guarantors only to assist the parties, not to decide. Peru and Ecuador had to agree. And a terms of reference had to be negotiated for the military observers. Once the terms of reference, once the rules were agreed, everything could be dealt with and was. From the painting of MOMEP helicopters by hostile radar to secret force buildups engineered by part of one of the sides. Using the law enabled the parties of peace within Peru and within Ecuador to seize the initiative. A key dispute was resolved by a panel headed by the Chief Justice of Brazil's Supreme Court. That Chief Justice, by the way, Nelson Jovim, later became Brazil's Minister of Defense. And in 2011, he stood where I stand now to receive this Perry Award. But just as the peace between Peru and Ecuador was proving the value of the law, the United States Senate stopped ratifying international treaties. We have not ratified the global law of the sea even after it was rewritten to meet U.S. objections. We have also not ratified conventions that advance U.S. regional interests in human rights or in fighting drugs by controlling illegal firearms. Sandra Day O'Connor summarized the consequences very well. The decision not to sign on to legal frameworks the rest of the world supports is central to the decline in American influence in the world." End of quote. In 1991, OAS Resolution 1080 established common grounds for action against interruptions of the democratic process. But it also called for proposals and incentives to support democracy a call that was never followed up with resources or specifics. The current tragedy in Venezuela is due to failures in implementation by the member states, starting with Venezuela, 
rather than to any failure of multilateralism. Much the same could be said about other hot button issues like migration and trade. Sovereign nations, and I don't need to tell you the United States is a sovereign nation, just as those that are represented here by you ambassadors accredited to Washington and to the OAS. Sovereign nations have the right to decide who and what enters and leaves their territory. A wall that channels peoples and goods to an entry exit point at which clear rules are enforced is fine. But if the wall is breached or circumvented or you get to the exit entry point and there are no rules, it becomes a Maginot line, impressive but ineffectual. The world needs laws and relationship building, not walls and nation building. Lectures and barriers are less effective than relations based on respect and shared rules. Nothing will last unless all concerned feel that at least some of their own interests are being advanced. Which brings me to my third and last point. Even if interagency differences here in the United States were all miraculously resolved, we would still need to work efficiently with other countries. To reconcile different national interests requires knowledge Institutional ties maintained by a network of professionals who know how to work together can help contain issues that might otherwise escalate into conflict. In effect, it's a valuable insurance policy for progress and peace. Bill Perry understood this. As Secretary of Defense in the years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, he supported the establishment of the Marshall Center in Germany to help military and civilian officials from both NATO and the Warsaw Pact to learn to work together. And because he understood that geography matters, he then supported the creation of similar centers for other parts of the world. This Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies, or CHDS, now known simply as the Perry Center, has an international faculty and students, ties to countries and institutions large and small, and an annual fall program that examines US security and defense structures and policy. For years, the graduates of the Inter-American Course in International Law in Rio de Janeiro and of the Inter-American Defense College here at Fort McNair have had enviable records. Between them, the OAS and the Perry Center are forging relationships and cadres of public servants who can help turn a world, a difficult world, to mutual advantage. They are, in effect, a unique foundation for a safe neighborhood. And this brings me to a concluding personnel recommendation. In this increasingly disorderly world, we in the United States might do well to link cultural sensitivity and knowledge of how to make things work to eligibility for promotion. In 1986, the Goldwater-Nichols Act established that to be eligible for promotion to a general or flag officer, a military officer had to have both senior education and a completed joint duty tour. Let's steal a page from Goldwater-Nichols for the civilian side of the house. 
Might a tour in the UN, in the OAS, in the IMF, or some other international organization become a requirement for promotion to the senior executive service or to the senior foreign service? So I return to my opening. Times have changed, but some old truths still apply. Geography and neighborhood still matter. Sovereignty still matters. Yet in today's world, we cannot any longer retreat like Voltaire to cultivate our own garden. To take care of ourselves, we must also deal with the outside world, our neighbors perhaps first of all. It will not be easy. The logo at the bottom of the Perry Center's crest, mens et fides mutua, mutual understanding and trust. That stuff that when you have it in your gut, you know how to move and who to move with, has guided the center during 20 years of progress. It must continue. It really is an honor to receive the William J. Perry Award for Excellence in Security and Defense Education. And it's a particular honor to receive it in this setting with all of you and on this 20th anniversary of the center. Thank you very much. Ambassador Naudi, I'm grateful that both uh, you, your family, and your many friends and colleagues could spend the afternoon with us here at National Defense University. In a one-hour ceremony, we were only able to highlight but a small fraction of what your contributions have been to this hemisphere and the broader security and defense education community. But it is our hope that your work, like the work of so many past Perry Award winners, will inspire another generation of scholars and practitioners to the kind of exceptional effort that we honor here today. I want to thank you all for coming today, and more so, thank you for your support to the Perry Center each and every day. I look at the faces of this in this room and uh, think of how, usually in settings uh, less elegant than here in Lincoln Hall, uh, how many of you have contrib contributed to the center's success over the last 20 years. Many of you have shared your expertise in our classrooms, either as lecturers or students. Others have been our partners, either here in Washington or elsewhere in the region, working with us as we develop workshops, seminars, and other academic programs. Finally, I'd like to recognize and thank the previous directors and acting directors of the Perry Center here with us today. And I'd like you to please stand up when I call your name, Mr. Jay Cope, Dr. Rich Downey, and Mr. Ken LaPlante. <laughs> we know every day that this institution was built on the shoulders of those uh, who preceded us, and we hope that you remain uh, proud of what your institution is and is to become. So on behalf of all the men and women of the Perry Center, including those who organized today's event uh, so flawlessly, uh, thank you for coming, and como decimos a nuestros amigos aquí en el Central Perry, no adiós, sino hasta pronto. Gracias. <laughs>